that this organization was actually started by the president of Bowdoin College. And it, the dominating denominations at that time in the Christian Civic League were Episcopalians and Congregationalists. That probably wouldn't be the case today, I can tell you that. A lot of things have changed since 1897. But the mission of the Christian Civic League hasn't changed, which is to bring a biblical perspective to public policy. That's, that's what our mission is. And we execute that in various ways by, you know, by like with our emails, informing people what's going on so they can be prayerful and consider what role they might take. We, we encourage people to be civically minded. We encourage people to get involved in politics. We recruit folks to get involved in politics. And we, we try to enact laws that reflect God's justice and God's righteousness and God's mercy and his character in our laws as well. And that's the, the lobbying part of what we do. As a matter of fact, if, if I'm on a golf course somewhere, like I just was last week down in Miami, and I'm golfing with someone I've never met, and they say to you, what do you do for work? I usually say, well, for lack of a better term and not getting into a long discussion, I'm a lobbyist. That's really a lot. what I spend a lot of my time doing is lobbying, talking to legislators uh, about certain things, and then also encouraging other people to be involved in grassroots lobbying themselves, to contact their legislators, to talk that this matters to them, and, and so on. So that's a lot of what we do. That's how we kind of execute our mission. But as I've said, if I've said it once, I've said it a thousand times, that you know the what we do and the how we do is really inconsequential if we don't have the why down, the reason that we do it. You know, Jesus Christ came to this earth, and if being right was enough, he never would have come. Jesus was right before he came down, but he came down to be obedient to the Father and his love for the Father and his love for us. No matter what we do, no matter what topic that we broach, no matter what we decide to do when we speak out and speak up, we have to make sure that the why is absolutely pure, that our motivations are in line with the motivations that God instructs us. So with that in mind, I'd ask you to please take your Bibles and turn to a very, very, very common passage, and it's Romans chapter 12. The book of Romans, chapter 12. As a matter of fact, some 36 or 37 years ago, when Terry and I first started dating, um, down in Pensacola, Terry used to challenge me that we would memorize a chapter together while we were dating. Of course, we couldn't do anything else down in Pensacola, so we used to memorize chapters. This was the very first chapter that we memorized together as a couple when we were dating. I had a great influence positively on Terry in our, in our relationship. <laughs> Romans chapter 12. I'm reading out of the NIV the first couple of verses. I know many of you have memorized these verses probably in one translation or another. Therefore, Paul saying, I urge you, or I beseech you, or I beg you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. So because God is merciful, offer your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual or sometimes a reasonable act of service, or this is your reasonable service. And this is the word that we get liturgo from, litur liturgy, service. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. So, Paul is saying, brothers, what sh how shall we live? Well, we know we should live by in accordance with God's will. Well, how can we know what God's will is? If you want to know what God's will is, Paul said, then listen, you need to transform your mind. So what motivates us to do that? Because that's not easy. In other words, going against the grain and the patterns of the world, it's God's mercy. He said, in light of the fact that God is merciful. He doesn't say in light of the fact that, you know, you're going to go to hell or all these other things. He says, in light of God's mercy. To those of you that are already in the covenant, that know his grace, in light of that mercy... Consider what is your reasonable service, Latero. And that is sacrifice. Your reasonable service is sacrifice. 
Now, a lot of you know that my background is that before I did this, I was involved in education for a number of years, and then I also uh, was the music director of Bangor Baptist Church when we went through some few, a few changes up there a few years ago. And so when we went into those significant changes in the culture of that church, we really grappled with what does it mean to worship? And not the music styles and things like that, but really what does it mean to worship? Because if Paul says that's our reasonable service or in the NIV that's our act of worship, then what does that mean? And really when you think about worship, when you look in Abraham and all the other things that we study in the Old Testament and the New Testament, worship really comes down to submission. It's what it is, putting yourself on the altar, submitting, submitting to his will going against what our natural inclinations may be and our instincts of selfishness and all those other things because of the curse, going against those and offering myself to God, being that leaf in the wind of his spirit to do whatsoever he will, because he's worthy. It's really kind of a bodacious, audacious claim that he makes that everything is about him. You know, we can't be like that. But he can because he's perfect and because it is all about him. So everything that we do through an act of submission should be to glorify him. So as I say those things to you, I know those aren't like ear tickling things. You've all heard those things before, maybe very profound, but I know that's nothing new. But yet, what does this have to do with someone standing here that's you know, involved in going down to Augusta and Washington, D.C., and asking you to email and phone and, and your legislators and so on. And that's some of the dots that I'm hoping to connect today. Now, if you would, turn to the book of Psalms and turn to Psalm 78. Psalm 78. When we started kind of studying this back at Bangor Baptist Church when I became the, the worship director, one of the words that kept on coming up again and again that David used when he was talking about worship, and certainly David was a, a, a man after God's heart, and we know that David wasn't perfect, but we, you know, there were many parts of David's life that we look, at, especially in the book of Psalms, about how to relate to God in regard to worship. And this is one of those examples uh, Let's go back to verse 70. He, God, chose David, his servant, to keep him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, the Jacob, of Israel, his inheritance. Then verse 72 says, And David shepherded them with integrity of heart and skillful hands he led them. Now, a word that comes up again and again and again in the Psalms, and especially in regard to David, is worshiping with an integ integrity. Integrity. Now, oftentimes when we think of integrity, it's within the idea of right behavior or good character, and that certainly is part of it. You know, if I ask you if there's something missing in public service today, and I said, do you think integrity is like the dominant thing you know, characteristic that we see in our public service today, you would say, uh, no, no, probably not. We'd be probably pretty quick to make the judgment that, you know, integrity, honesty, boy, is, doesn't seem to be valued. It doesn't seem to be the priority that it was at one time. Um, you know, we, I don't want to sound like the old fogey, but, you know, there was a time when people used to be able to shake hands on something, and, man, the last thing they'd ever do was go back on that. Not everybody, but that was, that was a fairly dominant aspect of our society, that a, a man's word was, you know, all he had. Good name of your family, you know, things like that. Integrity really mattered. And that aspect of integrity is, it's legitimate. That's a legitimate facet of integrity. But when it comes to worship, it's not the only facet. It's not the only meaning. When we say something is integral to something else, or when we even talk about the word of uh, integers and so on, like, you know, the digits on my hand, they're, they're integers and so on. You know, the number one is an integer and so on. You know, that all comes from the root words that we're talking about, integrity, meaning wholeness. 
wholeness, totality. Not just good behavior, but talking about wholeness, being integrated as well. So one of the challenges that we face is making sure that we are worshiping with integrity. Now, a lot of times we think about that, well, I want to sit here and sing a song, um, and then I can't go out and live like the devil because, you know, that's going to compromise, you know, the, the, uh, someone else accepting what I may have to say about eternity if my life isn't consistent with biblical standards. Now, obviously, there's a truth to that, but I want to get a little bit of beyond the behavior as far as the idea of integration of our life is to make sure that there, there's, there is consistency. And a lot of times we focused on behavior rather than focusing on what David did, which was the relationship with God that motivated him to have good behavior, to make sure that his life did have integrity, that it was whole, that it was consistent, that he didn't do one thing here and another thing here, and, that, and so on. Now again, did he do that with perfection? Absolutely not. Matter of fact, if you ask the common per person walking down the street, what do you think about when you think of David and they haven't even been in Sunday school, what are they going to say? Oh, yeah, David and Bathsheba, right? I mean, the, 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 you know, one of the really famous stories in the Bible. Unfortunately, David is known for his failure, but yet we know that David was a man after God's own heart. And, it, and just like Paul said, in light of God's mercy, in light of God's mercy, because he knew God was merciful, because he knew God was patient, because he knew that God really loved him, that's what motivated him to have integrity in his life and wholeness in his life. And we should strive that there should be no part of our life that is not whole within the context of God's will. So with that being said, I want you to know that when I go out and promote this particular arena, public policy arena, politics, civics, whatever you, you want to call it, I meet opposition. Sometimes when I sit down and talk with people about why I think it's a good idea to step up and let God's light shine in the public arena in regard to some of these really difficult issues that we have to deal with that we're facing in our society. So this morning, I thought I would share with you some of the reasons why people say that we really shouldn't do this or why it's not a high priority, and not just for the purpose of like saying, oh, yeah, th those are good reasons, so now I'm going to start, you know, every time Carol asks me to write my legislator, I'm going to or whatever, but I hope you do, but that's not the highest priority, so that you can see there should be no part of our life if we're really acting in integrity that is not submitted to advancing God's will. And we'll look into sp specifics of that. First of all, when I say, you know, we need to stand up, let's say, like for the life issue or, or anything else, um, I will get one answer that I get will be the kind of the non-participation argument or even what I would call the monastic argument. Um, we just got done with going through a cycle uh, with the Senate and the House. Some of you may be aware that we were trying to get Maine to be the 19th state uh, in the country to accept the restoration of religious freedom in our country. In other words, saying the state would have the same standard regarding the government interfering with your First Amendment rights as the federal government does. I won't get into all the details of that, but we, we just lost by two votes in the Senate and lost by more in the House so that Maine would have that same standard. Okay? That's, that's a religious liberty issue. Well, I got together a very diverse coalition when we were doing that. And actually, some people criticized me that because I thought, I really believe that everybody needs to be free. If not everybody's free, then I'm not free. So I was actually advocating for the religious freedom of Catholics and Protestants and the Amish and the Muslims and the Jews and Native Americans that are, you know, kind of quasi spiritual and so on. And we put together, I got to talk about a lot of people around this state about this issue. And one of the groups that I spoke of was up in Smyrna, Maine, up in with the Amish up there. And I sat down, it's the first time I'd really sat down with an Amish person and talked with them. Uh, Bishop Chris Hilty up in the, the general store up there in Smyrna. 
we sat there next to the fireplace with no electric lights, obviously, and all that, talking to him about this bill. And his view was this. He saw this great danger in America in regard to the hostility towards relig religious people and the intolerance, and he fears that someday that he won't be able to speak out of certain parts of the Bible because of this uh, uh, intolerance and this hostility. And yet, their view is that un under no circumstance will they participate in government because it's worldly. It's a worldly governmental system, so therefore they will not participate. And again, I'm not knocking the Amish. Matter of fact, there's some time that lifestyle appeals to me very much. Thank you. I would love to go back into the hills somewhere and just live with everybody that thinks the same way I do and, and so on. And, and you know, I'm not saying they're right or wrong or anything. I don't, I'm not critical, but this, this, his view was, Carol, I appreciate the fact that you're down there advocating. I really do, but I can't write a letter and have it read in the, you know, or anything like that. We don't vote. We don't do these type of things. So it's kind of a, what I'd call the non-participatory or the um, kind of a monastic approach that Christians have taken before is you just go off into the hills, you kind of give up, and you're just going to try to raise your family, but not necessarily have an influence on the culture. Now, I don't think that's going to be real controversial. I don't think most people would say, yeah, that's the way to go. But let's just, again, look at, that's kind of an extreme position, but I see other veins of that attitude in the church, not in the Amish, as well. Like, politics is dirty, so I don't want to, I don't want to get into something that's kind of like dirty, or it's messy business, and, you know, people disagree, and I don't, I'm not a disagreeable person, and I don't want to ever want to, you know, blah, 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 that, that type of non-participatory attitude. But here's my answer to that. First of all, I know that you know that in Romans chapter 13, God tells us that he ordains government. Just like he ordained the family, just like he ordained it. He said God ordains it. And that's really kind of a mind-blowing topic when we really delve into it, when we consider that Paul told us to submit ourselves to those powers that God has ordained. You know, some of us may have issues with our present administration and things are going around and you think it's pretty bad, but you know who was in charge when Paul wrote that? Nero. Yeah. You know, the guy that liked to take Christians and dip them in tar and put them on a pole and light them for their parties that they have in Rome. We're not there yet. Okay? And yet, God told us to submit ourselves to the authorities that he has ordained. And then I look at Joseph. God used Joseph and Moses as well in positions of power to promote his will. I mean, especially look at the life of Joseph. Here was a guy that lived before they even knew what God's name was. You think about that. Didn't know who Jehovah God was or anything like that. He just knew he was the God of, he was the God of Abraham and, and so on. And yet, in, in, in the whole story of Joseph, the word God's not, you know, it's just, there's no synagogue, there's no nothing, there's no really religion yet. But yet Joseph was willing to basically submit himself to God and through circumstances that most of us would say were pretty difficult circumstances, yet God used that government to basically bring the nation of Israel back in to feed them and to take care of them during that famine. So if government is such a bad thing, and look at, look at Cyrus. God used Cyrus to rebuild the Temple of Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity and so on and so on and so on. Now, I'm not saying there aren't bad things in the government, but I meet some Christians that are either, they think it's so bad they don't want to have anything to do with it, or they're anti-government. They're like anarchists. Have you met some of them? Government is not bad. Government is a good thing. And when we even look in, in verse, seven, uh, verse 72 of Psalm 78, God said he took David out of the shepherd pens and put him in as a shepherd of, as a king of the nation of Israel. God uses government. So don't use that as a cop out to not to, not to participate because it's like kind of messy, dirty business. God has worked through government. God has ordained government. Now, just like everything else, Satan can take it 
and, and have excesses or, or have it be corrupted and not be what God originally intended. But that doesn't mean we give up on the model. That doesn't mean that we just, just kind of seclude ourselves and not participate. Secondly, there's what I would call kind of the incongruence model. And that's where, oh, I remember, I think, oh, about a year ago, I remember getting a phone call from a, from a church and just saying, um, Carol, we know we've been very you know, involved with the league over the years, and there was a new pastor that's come in, and we're not going to financially support the league anymore because we just don't see it as a kingdom ministry. We just don't see it as, you know, we're, we're going to focus on soul winning, and we don't see this as a kingdom ministry. And I remember at that time when I got that phone call, um, I called Dr. Chris Nanigan. And a lot of you know Chris. Chris is the uh, involved in missions, and I just lost my unit here just a second. <laughs> uh, with outreach to Asian National, am I still on there, Brian? Okay. And I asked Chris, I said, Chris, you know, I'm starting to hear this, and how do you feel? There I go. You know, about the argument that this, that it's really not, that working in the public policy arena is not, you know, advancing the kingdom of God. And Chris said, that's really the opposite of what I think. He said, I think it's, it's critical for us. Now, this is, and I think I may have touched on this before, but I ask you to kind of hang with me a little bit. There is, I see in the church right now, a movement that is similar in the church to what was going on in Europe in the late 20s, in the early 30s. Now, they didn't call it this, but I would refer to it as, as dualism, okay? In other words, they would make comments like this, especially in Germany, where they would say, all right, as a church, we are looking forward to the kingdom coming, and so that all our focus is going to be on the gospel of Jesus Christ and ushering people into that kingdom, but we will not basically dirty our hands with anything except the church and church life. So we're going to talk about heaven. We're going to talk about ushering in the kingdom. But if someone over here is doing something with which we don't agree or we think is inconsistent with the Bible, that's a different vein. And it's a different circle. It's a different arena. We have the church arena, and then we have the world over here, and we really can't go over. It's not our business to walk over into this arena. And one of my favorite historical figures is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And I would highly recommend you read uh, any of the biographies, but especially uh, Eric Metaxas, uh, his recent work on, on Bonhoeffer is incredible. Bonhoeffer was a pastor who was screaming to the people in Germany, you've got to move over into this arena. Can't you see what's happening? And it was the Socialist Party was taking over the German people with their anti-Semitism and some of their other views that we knew eventually what would happen now that we're looking back. And Bonhoeffer saw where this was going. And he felt that the church was basically asleep. He used that term all the time. The church of Germany was sleeping, and they wouldn't wake up. And eventually, when they finally did wake up, it was too late. And 8 million Jews end up dying. And that's harsh. And I understand we have free will and sovereignty, and I'm not going to try to give a disposition on that, but the fact is I don't believe it was God's will for the church to stand and say nothing when these things were going on over in the political arena because we can't. We can't do that. There's just two separate arenas. There's the sacred and the secular. You ever heard that? We have the sacred arena, and that's where we really put our focus, but not on the, not on the secular. I don't believe that's the way God created the world. I don't believe that's the way God created the world. That's not, that's not integrity. That's not wholeness. 
That's halfness. And yet many people have that philosophy in their mind and they're really influenced by that and they don't even realize it. Is there some part of this kingdom that we're willing to give up? And just say, we're going to wave the flag or we don't belong there? Because really, that's what we're saying. It's too bad. It's too messy. It's too dirty. Or it's too far gone. Really. So that's another one of the arguments that, that I often hear. And we, it's, it's kind of interesting, Jake, the songs that you pick uh, really go in line with a lot of things that I've been thinking as I've been preparing this. You know, we were just saying Amazing Grace, written by John Newton, and then, you know, Timlin added the, the phrase, my, my chains are gone, I've been set free. You realize that when we look at that, that's, it's from the, that incredible movie, Amazing Grace, about the life of Wilberforce and his struggle, 40-year struggle, never giving up to do away with the abhorrent practice of human slavery. And do you realize how many times Wilberforce was told the church should have nothing to do with that? That is a secular activity. That is a political activity. And the church should have no say in that whatsoever. He was told that again and again. And he refused to accept that. He refused to accept that. And as we know, that that during that time, eventually, you know, when we look at the Wesleyan revival and the great immorality that was going on in England, it's no wonder that they were willing to allow human beings to be slaves when you consider how spiritually dead they were before the Wesleyan revival and when people like Wilberforce and so on got involved, were influenced by that. And immediately, they looked outside of this artificial circle and said, look over here. There should be impact. There should be a difference in our community. As we become spiritually revived, we can't allow these injustices to occur because it is not consistent with the character of God. This is His creation, and His creation should reflect His character. And that's why I'm sure that you may or may not be aware of the, the criticism that uh, as we've tried to restore the reputation of the Christian Civic League. I use a phrase that a lot of people are not comfortable with, and some of you are going to shudder when I say it now, but I believe with all my heart, when you look at Wilberforce, and when you look at uh, Bonhoeffer, and when you look at other great reformers that were not do-gooders, they were responding to the gospel of Jesus Christ, I believe that when you look at that, there is an aspect that a revival, God's people should have an impact on the community not just themselves, and that's called social justice. And I believe that social justice, even though it has been taken to an extreme, and I don't think it should be the government forcing it to do it, but I think that the church should be consumed with social justice. If there is a true injustice that's not consistent with the Bible, then God's people should be known for standing up for those things. When we see human trafficking, when we see injustice that's in this world, when we see true lack of opportunities for people, even in areas in, in regard to uh, economics and so on, the church should speak to these things. Now, that doesn't mean we go around with the pablum and, and accept the lies that are also addressing these things, but God's truth needs to be shown into these areas. We can't be absent in these areas. We can't be non-participants. And neither can we say that is there anything that is incongruent or that, is, shouldn't, that the gospel should not be shining into that is not advancing the kingdom of God. And then the other area is kind of related to that same argument. And it's in the area of relevance or priorities. I remember going to probably the largest church in the state shortly after I'd become the director with... A good, uh, a good friend of mine that passes that church, and um, I actually knew him when he came to the Lord, his senior year in high school, and churches uh, uh, passes this large church, and sat down with him and talked to him about possibly partnering on, on some things, because I knew that he was addressing some issues that I thought were really important, and maybe we could work together. And eventually, 
he said, well, we're kind of moving away from some of those things. And uh, Carol, I just believe Jesus is coming back. And we just don't have time to talk about anything else. And so, therefore, we are kind of moving away from addressing some of these societal ills and things like that. We're just, we're just, just again, we're just focusing on souls because we believe that Jesus is coming back and there's just not enough time. Now, obviously, I agree. I think Jesus is coming back. But God also told us to occupy. He told us to occupy. And the fact is, it's not an either or proposition. It's both. Salt and light. Light, yes, the truth. If, if you die and you're unreconciled to God and you have not received his plan of redemption, then yes, you are going into a crisis eternity. But there's also salt, where there's the preservative aspect of his people being there, which is not a passive thing, but it's an active thing. I, I mentioned this in Sunday school, and I'll just reference it again, that you know when we talk about some of these tough issues, hopefully with loving hearts and kindness and compassion. But when we talk about the taking of the unborn life, or when we talk about the truth of gender and marriage and things like that, there are some people that don't do it well. And I'm embarrassed that they do it. And I frankly question their motives, whether they're really doing it in love. But that does not and should not keep us from our responsibility to shining God's truth in and recognizing the preservative qualities of a nation whose God is the God of Israel and is reflecting his nature and the benefit to a society and the preserving aspect because there have been and should be times when revival takes place and it just doesn't happen in the four walls of the church, but there's incredible impact on the entire country. Jesus Christ came to this world incarnate. He came in flesh. The flesh matters. Walls matter. Rocks matter. People matter. God created them. And they're all to be redeemed. And they're all to be influenced by the truth of God. And as I said during uh, the Sunday school as well, you know, when we step into these arenas and when we do occupy and we do shine light, and we do recognizing the preserved qualities of God's truth, I can tell you that I constantly have to motive, uh, examine my motives because it's easy to get frustrated. It's easy to get angry. And for me, part of my nature is I like winning arguments. I don't, I don't like losing. Then I recognize that's a weakness of mine. You know, when I was 32 years old, I, I, I did very little to restrain that. I'm doing a better job of that now, but I still constantly have to check that part of my nature of wanting to dominate intellectually or in an argument or something like that just because it feels good. Hey, I like that. That's not a good thing. That's not the way Jesus did it. But when we stand in the family arena, in the work arena, in the public policy arena, in any arena where we walk, we should be espousing God's truth with integrity. Because without a life of integrity, that truth, therefore, is invalidated. Because you can say John chapter 4 or Psalm 78 or whatever, and the world doesn't care about that. They care about a life of integrity, of wholeness. That's what validates your message to them. That's why we do it. The truth of gender, the truth of the sacredness of human life, the truth of freedom and the true source of freedom that's not the government. The government doesn't give us freedom. The government's supposed to protect it, that it comes from God. When we speak of those things from lives of integrity and wholeness, we might not be able to get them into a church right away. But we're pointing them to the source of truth as well. And Romans 1 tells us that those things matter and that those things show the mercy of God and the truth of God and they move them out of a society that believes we're here by randomness and we're an accident towards the understanding that we are created beings and this is a created universe and it makes sense. And you want to call that preemptive grace or whatever else, but the fact is standing for the truth does have eternal consequences if we do it 
the right way. Would you take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 4? And I kind of chuckled again when I saw the very first chorus that we sang this morning. But this is the story, John chapter 4, the woman at the well. And you know, Jesus shows up, and everybody's kind of shocked. He's talking to a Samaritan woman, and, you know, she wants to talk, kind of throw Jesus off about, should we be worshiping here or worshiping there, and all those things. And, and Jesus explains exposes her in a loving way to move her towards repentance and so on. We know the story, but at the end of this, in verse 23, Jesus says, Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and and in truth. There is, right now, a manifestation in our world of God's, of, of man's rebellion against God. And it's one that cannot be ignored. And it has to do with the attempt to convince people that gender is irrelevant. And those of you who pay attention, you know what I'm talking about. When we talk about the marriage issue, that's not the core of that argument. It's that there is an attempt to basically say that what every little two, three, four-year-old boy and girl knows to be true is not true. It's the differences between men and women. Now for us, as much even we may even be forced and pushed and intimidated away from the truth that God created man and woman, and there are differences, but the fact is that our country and this world is heading to a cliff because it's a lie. And it's, and it's one of the greatest lies because of the implications, as you've heard me say before, that if, if a society can come to the point that there is no difference between men and women, then you are going over a cliff because all bets are off for a society that can actually accept something that is so evident and so untrue. And that's one of the difficult issues that we're facing right now as a church. Because those people that sometimes I talk to say, Carol, you know, why do you stand up for marriage? You know, the battle's lost. You know, it's all over. You know, it's sweeping across this country. There's nothing you can do about it. Or they say, you know, you can't really talk about this issue um, because you can't do it in love. And so you're, you're only come, you're the only way you can do it, it can't be done without coming across as judgmental or discriminating and so on like that. And, and so we as a church, we're no longer, we're not addressing this issue any longer because God is love and God accepts everybody and therefore we don't want to be misunderstood. Now, I can honestly tell you, this is an issue I'd just soon not talk about, frankly. I really would rather not because of those things and the things that people say about you or the fact that you are misunderstood even when you are doing it the right way. But I ask you, is that really love? Is that really love? Is that spirit and truth? And it isn't. And for those of us, and I don't mean this from a position of superiority because I can't say I walk this every day, but for anybody that really has crawled up upon that altar of reasonable service and submission, do we really have the choice of saying, I'm going to speak about this truth, but I'm not going to speak about that truth. I'm going to speak about this truth, but I'm not going to speak about that truth. Because you realize the invalidation that occurs because that's why the enemy is doing this, is to invalidate the authority of the creator of this universe and his word. Spirit and in truth. You can't just say God is loving and merciful because he truly is. But God is also the author of truth and the creator. And you are actually deluding the opportunity to come to the true God and the only hope that anybody has 
when we invalidate that truth or when we're afraid to speak that truth. And again, I, I don't know how many times I can say it's necessary to say it. It has to be done with being compelled by the love of Jesus Christ. If you went to a wedding this year, you've probably heard 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You know, the Apostle Paul said that I don't care how much you know, I don't care how much, how devout you are, I don't care what miracles you perform, what kind of spiritual authority that you have, that if you don't have love, you're nothing. You're that tinkling cymbal or that gonging, you know, that clanging gong. So Paul said the same thing. We are to be compelled by the love of Jesus Christ. Not our anger, not our prejudices, which we all have. We have to be compelled by the love of Christ. But I beg you, as the executive director of the Christian Civic League, as a brother, knowing that you have the desire to be what you were created to be, that salt and the light, don't use the love of Christ as an excuse not to be that salt and light. Because certainly, and those of you that have children, <laughs> know that love isn't always about hugs and kisses. There better be hugs and kisses. But there's other times, because you love your children, you have to warn them. And you have to do whatever it takes to keep them from destructive behavior or away from lies and towards truth. And how much more, how much more your Father in heaven, and how much more is he counting on us to do the same thing? So therefore, pray for courage. Pray for wisdom and discernment because it's not an, we're not always acting in the same role. Sometimes it's light, light, sometimes it's salt. Examine our hearts and our motivations but don't be passive. Be active in every single arena that he's called you. Obviously this morning, I've challenged you in regard to the public policy arena. And that's not an easy arena. But if he's called us to be in every one of those arenas, then I ask you, as I ask you to pray for yourself, that you pray for us. Um, pray for me. There are times that this... I'd rather be doing something else, frankly. Really have. But you know when you have that call, you don't have that choice. And yet, there's so many times it's an incredible privilege, and I appreciate it. I can tell you even this last week, um, I probably let my passions get the best of me. And probably took too much liberty in a relationship with a couple of our senators that I was disappointed, and I let them have it. And I'm restoring those relationships right now. It felt good at the time. <laughs> but that's not what the Lord wanted. I hope you pray for me, that the Lord, I'm not your voice. The, my predecessors used, used to say that we're the voice of the Christian church in Augusta. No, we're not. You're the voice. We're not the voice. So hopefully we can keep you informed, inspired, inspired. Um, Consider maybe whether God's calling you to participate in some way, either directly or indirectly, taking your responsibility serious in this area. We live in a great country. It's not perfect. But even in the area of religious liberty, man, think about what's going on historically and what's even going on now in this world, the people that don't experience what we have. It's a blessing from God. What are we doing to be stewards for that? What are we doing to protect that? not just selfishly, but so we can continue, as someone prayed, to have the freedom to even be here. How seriously are we taking that blessing and defending it for the sake of the kingdom? I know those are really solemn things and those are really serious things, and I know that the answer to courage is God's joy, it's not the absence of fear and all those things, because all that sufficiency is in Christ. That's my prayer that you would allow me to set myself aside in this responsibility that I have, that we could be a witness down there 
and at the same time embolden God's people to step up and be witnesses in whatever arena God's called you to. So please pray for us. Um, I am going to be at the back of the auditorium and with any of that literature, I would really encourage you to consider signing up back there. There's a, I think there's a legal pad back there. You can put your name down and sign up for our monthly uh, letter and our weekly emails to, to let you know what's going on. If there's some issue that you thought I'd be talking about today that I didn't mention, I'm happy to stay after and discuss some of those specifics. But our website is CCL Maine, Christian Civic League, CCL Maine. Org. You can find out a lot about our information there. You can also sign up online for all those things as well. So, Jack, am I to close here? Or? Okay, let's stand and pray, please. Father, we thank you for your word. And, Lord, that we're not dependent upon our rationale, um, our emotions, or culture, or tradition, that we can go to your word um, with confidence. And so, Lord, I would just ask this morning, as we've had the opportunity to sing your praises, Lord, maybe to be challenged to submit any part of our lives to you, as difficult as that is. Father, that we would leave here this day going out um, with courage, with confidence, with your joy, that we might impact those souls that you love and died for in a way to move them into the kingdom of God. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good to hear you again. Thanks. It's good to be here.